As members of the minor gentry, the Digby family would have been expected to have a garden which reflected their social status as well as their social obligation to guests. Situated directly in front of the main entrance, the front courtyard had an important role in this. The tasteful formality and order in gardens had come from Europe, particularly Italy, France and the imperial court in Vienna. This formality was achieved by the geometric planting of carefully positioned plants, combined with closely tended hedges, topiary, obelisks and statues. Together they gave the impression of control over nature, which was seen as needing to be tamed. By the early 17th century, the importation of plants from Europe and further east, as well as the West and the New World, was well established. These attractive novelties were often expensive, but could have provided talking points as guests were shown around the gardens. New plants were provided by expert plant hunters who were sponsored by wealthy clients and there were networks of botanists who exchanged plants and information. These higher status features can all be seen in this area of the garden, the one exception being the lavender which basks and bakes on the south facing front of the house. Lavender had been introduced to Britain by the Romans who valued its medicinal and other herbal qualities over 1500 years ago. By the 1620s lavender was not only used medicinally, it was an important component of nosegays, which were believed to prevent foul air transferring diseases to the human body. It was also strewn on the floor to be trodden on to release pleasant odours to overcome the natural stench of everyday life. Natural order is imposed on this area by the planting of two kinds of hedges which enclose it and give it the feeling of being in a room. The five foot high outer hedge is of basic yew, which is clipped with straight sides and top and is at least two feet deep. Three feet in front of the yew is a low box hedge, which butch onto the yew to form enclosed borders allowing controlled planting. From a gardening point of view, the courtyard offers particular challenges. The yew and box hedges both produce lots of shade, as does a neighbouring weeping black mulberry tree. In addition, the soil in the borders is barely 12 inches deep. Further challenges come from the omnivorous resident grey squirrels, from the badgers who regularly use the soil in the borders as a latrine, and the snails which regard the hedges as perfect sanctuaries. Given that the house is fully open to the public from the beginning of April until the early or mid-autumn, the planting has been chosen to reflect that. Spring is ushered in with a display of tulips and crown imperials, both of which come with an interesting but contrasting story to tell. We take tulips for granted now because the bulbs are so readily available and the cut flower season has been greatly extended by various horticultural techniques. But tulips only appeared in England in the 1560s and because of their colour and variations were highly prized luxuries. They had made their way to England over many centuries, from Central Asia via the Sultans of Turkey, the Imperial Court in Vienna, and then into Holland, which was on the cusp of experiencing its golden age. The full story is far too long to relate here, but by the 1620s many varieties had been developed by horticulturalists in England, including John Gerard and John Parkinson. You may have heard of the mania for collecting rare and exotic tulips which gripped Holland by the 1530s. Well, we enjoyed our tulips without trying to embrace them as a lifestyle essential. We plant the tulips in pots because of risk of damage by the aforementioned squirrels and badgers, not to mention the shallow soil, but that actually presents them in a more formal and visually pleasing manner. Once they've gone over, the tulips are removed and dried out, while the pots are then planted with the next round of exotics, to which we will return shortly. The other high status spring flower with only ornamental value is the crown imperial, Fritillaria imperialis. This is a dramatic statuesque flower which had trodden almost the same path at roughly the same time as the tulip. In 1597, John Gerard wrote, this plant hath been brought from Constantinople and made denizens in our London gardens, whereof I have plenty. Although there are more colours available today, it was mainly the brick red variety that was grown then, so it wasn't so much the colour, but the form which delighted the owners. 
In 1629, John Parkinson wrote, The crown imperial, for its stately beautifulness, deserveth the first place in this our garden of delight. Four tapering wooden obelisks, which have been painted red, offer a variation in height and colour around the borders. Their grey caps bear an effigy of a peacock, which reflects the image of the Manners family peacocks, seen on the downpipes of the house. The obelisks act as a support for vigorous golden hop plants, which need to be pruned regularly once they have got into their growing strides. Incidentally, hops are interesting because they were actually once a contentious part of the brewing industry. In England, before the early 16th century, we made ale, which was flavoured with various herbs, including ale cost, not beer, which included hops, a strange foreign habit. There were even laws passed against the importation of hops for beer making, but probably with an influx of refugees from Europe came the use of hops, and before long we had embraced the habit. Incidentally, beer keeps longer than ale and can be made in much larger quantities. Scrambling up among the hops, we plant nasturtiums which add a splash of colour. Now we return to the summer planting of our terracotta pots and more plant introductions. Mirabilis jalapa, or marvel of Peru to give its common name, is not a regular in modern English gardens, but more so in France. Gerard regarded it as the marvel of the world rather than of Peru alone. He was thrilled that the one plant could produce flowers of several colours. Another name is four o'clock flower, for the blooms open at that hour, remain open all night, and close the following morning. The second summer resident in our pots is commonly known as Love Lies a Bleeding, a name actually given to it in 1665 by John Rea. Amaranthus cordatus, to give its Latin name, was called the Great Purple Flower Gentle in the 1620s. Another traveller from the New World, this time the Andes, this tender annual was grown as an edible grain crop by the indigenous people, but simply admired as an exotic marvel in England. That brings us to the final high-status plant, which is probably now most often grown by children, maybe at school. We are, of course, referring to the humble sunflower. Yes, it too was a native of Central America and Peru, where it was held in great esteem as the emblem of the sun god. The novelty of its height, the size of the flower, simply captivated the writers of the time. Both Gerard and Parkinson, almost 30 years apart, gushed about its features. Gerald calling it, in his herbal, the flower of the sun, or marigold of Peru. In spite of the usefulness of its seeds to modern life, it was then regarded as purely ornamental. Finally, as a symbol of the family's status, a brass-faced sundial sits on a large stone column, tall enough to be comfortably read by an adult. However, like our flowers, it is no friend of the shade. So that is the first of a series of garden rooms, which make up most of the formal section of this 1620s garden. All of the key plants of this area have been introduced into this country and were there primarily for their novelty value, unlike most of the other plants growing in the garden. <laughs>